All right, welcome to another lecture in which I'll continue teaching you about chemical kinetics, concentration, and rate laws. This, of course, continues from a previous lecture in which I did the same. The stuff we're going to get into in this lecture will be a little bit more in-depth and involve a lot of exciting calculations. Are you thrilled? I know I am. Let's get started. So in real life, one way to study how concentration actually affects the rate or speed of a reaction is to vary the concentration of a particular reaction and then just measure how it affects the amount of time required to make that reaction go. So for example, in this reaction, ammonium reacting with nitrate to form an M2 gas and water, the following observations happen to have been made. Woo, that's a crazy table. Now you should notice in this table that they varied the initial concentrations of these reactants. In experiments one, two, and three, they kept the concentrations of NO2 minus constant while varying the concentration of ammonium, and then they observe what happened to the rate or speed of the reaction. In experiments four, five, and six, they did the opposite, keeping ammonium's concentration constant while varying the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. They then observed how that affected the overall rate or speed of the reaction. So how does changing the concentrations of these two reactants, ammonium and nitrogen dioxide, affect the reaction rate? That's really the question we're trying to get at. If we look closer at the table, you'll notice that in trials one, two, and three, if we double the concentration of ammonium, what happens to the reaction rate? Well, it doubles. If we double it again, what happens to it? Well, yeah, it about doubles. What that means then is that if I vary the concentration of ammonium in this reaction, the rate is going to increase or decrease proportionally in a one-to-one -one relationship. If I double ammonium, the rate doubles. If I triple ammonium, the rate triples. If I have the concentration of ammonium, the rate halves. Does that make sense? Now let's take a look at varying the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. You'll notice that if I double the concentration of nitrogen dioxide from 0.0202 to 0.044, what happens to the reaction rate? Yeah, it looks like it about doubles. What if I double that concentration again? Once again, it looks like it also about doubles. So just as with ammonium, if I vary the concentration of nitrogen dioxide in this case, there's a one-to-one -one proportional relationship of how that affects the rate or speed of the reaction. Whew. Hopefully that makes sense. That's basically what we get out of this table. OK, so that took a lot of bit explaining, but let's see if we can learn more from it. We express the way concentration affects a reaction's rate or speed by using this equation. Rate is equal to K times the concentration of ammonium multiplied by the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. This is called this particular reaction's rate law, which is not to be confused with the relative rate equations that we discussed earlier. In general, then, for a reaction such as this generic one, the rate law will be equal to K multiplied by the individual concentrations of the reactions raised to some numbers m and n. K, by the way, is called the rate constant, which will vary from one reaction to another. Please notice that the products do not appear anywhere in the rate law. This, once again, is different from the relative rate equation that we discussed earlier. So what in the world are m and n? Well, I'll tell you. The terms m and n are called reaction orders. These have to be determined experimentally. Please remember that m and n are not necessarily the same as the coefficients in front of a and b in the balanced chemical equation. Sometimes they can be the same, sometimes they're different, but they don't have anything necessarily to do with each other. m and n can only be determined by experiment. For the previous rate law we discussed here, the reaction of ammonium with nitrogen dioxide, we determined that if I double the concentration of ammonium, it doubles the rate. If I triple the concentration of ammonium, it triples the rate. If I double the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, it doubles the rate. If I triple it, it triples the rate, and so forth and so on. What does that mean about the uh, exponents here? It means that the exponents above ammonium and nitrogen, and nitrogen dioxide are both 1. In other words, there's a proportional 1 to 1 relationship between changing the concentration of each of these reactants and how the speed of this reaction changes. We say then that this reaction is first order with respect to ammonium and first order with respect to nitrogen dioxide. These numbers are called the individual reaction orders for the reactant. The overall reaction order is obtained by adding these two numbers together. 1 plus 1 equals 2. This reaction then is considered to be second order 
overall. Okay, at this point, I want you to pause and just take a breather. I know that I've just thrown a ton of crazy confusing information at you. Please rest assured we're going to work through some really cool examples that I think by the time we're done will help you to get a tighter grasp on how this actually works. Here's the first one. The rate law for a particular generic reaction is a given according to this equation. Which of the following statements is false? The reaction is first order with respect to A. The reaction is second order with respect to B. The reaction is second order overall. K is the reaction rate constant. Or if B is doubled, the reaction rate will increase by a factor of 4. I'm not going to answer this question for you, but we'll let you think about it and see if you can come up with the answer for yourself. How about this one? A reaction A plus B goes to C obeys the following rate law. Rate equals K times the concentration of B squared. What are the reaction orders for A and B? And what is the overall reaction order? Once again, I'm not going to answer this question for you, but we'll let you think about it and see if you can come up with the answer yourself. That brings us back then to how we go about calculating M, N, and K. If we're given experimental data plotting concentration versus rate, as I showed you in the earlier example with ammonium and nitrogen dioxide, we can calculate the rate orders M and N and the rate constant K. I'm now going to show you how by using the following reaction as an example. If we were asked once again to calculate M, N, and K, here's what we do. Step one, write down the rate law, which in this case is going to be rate equals K times the concentrations of A and B, each raised to some exponent M and N. We have no idea what M and N are yet. But we should note that M and N do not equal A or B, respectively. I mean, they might end up equaling A or B, but if they do, it's just completely coincidental. Because M and N can only be determined experimentally and not by just looking at the balanced chemical equation. Step two, figure out what M and N are by doing the following. First, for two measurements where the concentration of B is kept the same, but A is varied, divide the higher A value by the lower A value. We'll call the number you get here purple A. <laughs> now, divide the reaction rate for higher concentration of A value by the reaction rate for the lower concentration of A value. We'll call the number you get here purple B. Then set up the following equation. A raised to the M equals B. And then solve for M. This is the reaction order for A. OK, I realize these steps look really baffling. Please bear with me. After we get through these, I'll do an example, and you will see how to actually make this happen. Step three, repeat step two for B in order to get N. This gives you the reaction order for B. Step four, using your original rate law, shown here in red, put, uh, put in a rate from the experimental data. It doesn't matter which one you pick, along with the corresponding values for A, B, M, and N in order to solve for K. Got it? Probably not. Let's go ahead and do an example. All right. The data in this table were obtained for this crazy looking reaction here. What is the order of reaction with respect to chlorine dioxide? Please click the link here to watch me solve this on the whiteboard in a separate video. Now, here's a new question. What is the order of the reaction with respect to hydroxide? You can pause here and attempt this on your own. Then click the link here, where I will show you in a separate video how to do it on the whiteboard. That brings us to our next question. For this reaction, what is the overall order of the reaction? And next, what is the magnitude of the rate constant for the reaction? Once again, please click the link here to see how these are done in a separate video on the whiteboard. That brings us to another great example. The iodide ion reacts with hypochlorite ion, the active ingredient in bleach, just so you know, in the following way. This rapid reaction gives the following rate data. What is the rate constant K for this reaction? Now, once again, having done the example that we just did earlier, you're welcome to pause the video and attempt this on your own. You can then click this link to watch me solve it on the whiteboard. Here's another exciting example. The reaction shown here was studied with the following results. What is the rate when the concentration of chlorine dioxide equals 0 0.100 molar and of hydroxide is 0 0.05 molar? You're welcome to pause and try this. You can then click this link to watch me solve it on the whiteboard. That takes us to the end of this lecture. Please stay tuned for the next one in which I'll continue teaching you about reaction rates. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.